Today, I am joined by Nate Fisher. Uh, Nate Fisher is the co-founder of New Founding, an economic and cultural syndicate. He uh, previously co-founded uh, InvestRes, a billion-dollar real estate company, and has helped launch several civic organizations um, and is also a Claremont Institute Lincoln Fellow. Welcome, Nate. Thanks, Alex. Great to be on. Uh, I'm I'm very happy to have you on. Um, you are, uh, interestingly enough, a, a rare breed and and kind of the the wider circle of people coming on the show. Someone who is not only knowledgeable about finance, but also maybe has a, a bit of a more positive spin on the virtues of finance in general. Um, and as someone who's also worked in finance, um, I've I've worked kind of in origination for something like something similar to venture debt. Um, I also kind of have a little bit more of an insider look, and I don't I don't necessarily. Um, it, it just feels to me like there's a lot of kind of conspiratorial thinking about um, what finance is, uh, what you know the, the 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 big finance companies in the world are doing. So I feel like you you kind of add an an interesting layer of both experience and maybe positivity about about how we should look at this. So uh, maybe we could start with this: um, How should people in in our wider circle, you know, call it dissidents, people maybe a bit a bit marginalized by by the mainstream? Think about finance and its value in their lives. So I, I, I have mixed feelings about this. And to be clear, I, I have not been... I've always been in some ways in a more independent role in finance. I started in real estate, starting my own thing rather than working my way up on Wall Street. At the same time, I, I'm skeptical of the conspiratorial views. I think the reality is often far more banal. It's, it's not necessarily good. Uh, but it's not uh, it's not necessarily the product of conspiracies. My view is finance at its best is one of the greatest drivers of human uh, of human success, of human flourishing, of human achievement. And it's uh, if you think of investment, if you think if you think of sort of two forms of creative human output, there's the there's the output of the entrepreneur, there's the person who creates something from nothing, and then I think. Uh, Another side of that is the entrepreneurial bet on a person. So finance at its best is a form of leverage that allows you to do more than you otherwise could do. If you're an entrepreneur, if, you, if you're an entrepreneur who comes from an extremely wealthy family and you have a lot of money, you don't need finance. You have capital. You don't need that industry. But if you're anything other than that, finance is, uh, finance is a tool of leverage just like technology can be a tool of leverage. So just like a higher level programming language can give you the ability to do more with less time. Uh, finance can allow you to do more with less time. Uh, your ability to sell people on things can allow you to do more with less time. And to me, that's uh, if you believe that if you believe that economic production is good, if you believe that technology is good, finance can be good. But again, that's uh, that's sort of the optimist in me looking at the potential. Uh, that's not my judgment of necessarily uh, much of what exists today. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely um, you know a a very um, serious a chunk of critique against especially kind of con- consolidated um, global patterns of finance and a lot of kind of the you know the distancing from the from the level of abstraction that you de- describe as being kind of the ideal where someone puts a bet on an individual person or a, a company um, and you know. The, their bet is that they're going to grow by X percent, and you know that's reflected in the interest rate. Um, that would be kind of the, the the granular case, but a lot of what happens in finance nowadays is abstracted, you know, ten to ten degrees, and and I think the 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 complexity and the scale of it is essentially the the problem. Um, does this kind of reflect in in your um, in your projects as well at, at New Founding? Because essentially, I mean, we can go. A little bit deeper into, into what Newfound does. I mean, I've had Matt Peterson on; he's kind of described it. But uh, you could also maybe maybe give us a little bit of an overview. But it does seem like you know reigniting uh, finance and and thinking about what it takes to grow businesses from from the ground up, from that level of you know discussing it with the entrepreneur and making bets and making bets on things that. Um, you not only believe in, but maybe are ordered according to a certain vision of the common good that's not reflected in the market. Maybe um, I think that's that's something that our space is sorely missing, and I, I wonder if if that's a, an area that you're looking at. That's uh, that in many ways is central. So I've always, in some ways, I've never felt at home 
as a conservative per se, uh, I, I've never been excited by the concept of conserving things. I, I think there's a lot of good things to conserve. And I would say there's a lot of virtue to that. And I think it's good that there are people doing that. But that's not what gets me up in the morning. That's not what inspires me. What inspires me in many ways is is that question of what are we aspiring to? What are we focusing on? And this is a question you see a lot with technology. There's a lot of debate of is technology good or bad? There's a lot of people, conservatives, don't really like technology. They're fundamentally skeptical of technology in many ways. And I think uh, John Escanis actually had a piece in Compact that was really good where he he attributed the loss of conservatism fundamentally to the inherent disruption of technology. It's not a matter of, matter of the left controlling institutions. It's not a matter of them even controlling anything. It's that if your goal is primarily to conserve, technology is going to be disruptive and is fundamentally going to undermine any innovation is fundamentally going to undermine some good things. So the question then is, do we have a positive alternative vision? Uh, and that's that's really a central part of my focus because every time you're talking about leverage to do anything, again, if you're a conservative, there's more reasons to be skeptical of finance as well. You're, you're, there's more reason to be skeptical of anything that offers leverage. But if you have an alternative positive vision, then the question becomes leverage to do what? It's not good or bad. It can be, it can, leverage can be extremely bad if it's essentially providing a form of power to people who have a bad, bad vision. But I, uh, on the right, fundamentally, I think our, our driving mission, what we need, especially as a dissident movement, especially if we're going to really excite people as dissidents is what is the positive vision that they're actually fighting for? And then how do we, uh, as a group of people who are fundamentally at a disadvantage structurally, how do we use every lever that we can to, uh, ex- to, to organize and mo- motivate people around that and, and fight for it? So that's, uh, that's central. It's one that I, I know uh, you've had Charles Haywood on and Charles is an investor in our company and he's someone I, I share a lot with in terms of that, I think, fundamentally optimistic view of, of potential and optimistic, really positive view towards sources of leverage that can help us get there. Uh, but we need to uh, we need to work out what that positive is, and and to me, I would say my focus is often more on the the sorts of leverage that are going to structurally uh, a they're going to give us an advantage in this moment. So, what sorts of leverage are being uh, they're either being ignored by the other side, or they're they're just available to us. They're available to uh, they're available to us to use as well. And then, which of those will tend toward a structural outcome that is going to be conducive to sort of our vision of the common good. So that's that's not necessarily the the concrete for the common good. I think there's other people who do a much better job of of the specifics than I do there. But in terms of like what types of financial instruments are actually going to be conducive to a more human vision of the common good for a, a more human society, for instance. Yeah, I've just actually had uh, John asking us on the show, and we were discussing something similar. Um, it's, uh, I think, you know, the, the project is obviously very worthy, but I think, you know, the, one of the biggest challenges that, that kind of pre- presents itself pretty vividly to me is that a lot of the things that are happening both in the market and kind of as, as being downstream from technology, because they're, they're very much intertwined, are um, pushing people in the direction of kind of, you know, taking out the intermediary, making things easier, simpler. And if you look at this from kind of a common good perspective, it's um, essentially taking out uh, the opportunities for people to pra- to practice virtue in their in their own lives, and to you know to, to just exercise the muscle of becoming the kind of people that even can imagine a vision of the common good. Um, and it, it feels like a, a, this is kind of where the market is moving. I mean, you can see this in in all sorts of you know from addictive technologies to, to types of food, to everything being delivered to your door. And all of these individually obviously are in a way improvements. They help a lot. I mean, I don't want to be hypocritical here. I, I do get, you know, <laughs> grocery delivered because if you have a small child, uh, you know, shopping mm-hmm. opportunities are a bit complicated. So, um, you know, the, there's individually all of these actions that we, we, we get from, from the market finance complex are useful, but as a collective, they erode pretty much the substance of, of of what it means to be virtuous, which involves dealing with with hardship, dealing with other people, practice flexing your social muscles with people you don't like. Now you don't have to see people you don't like anymore. So um, I think that's why I think the the development and kind of chiseling out 
a clear vision of the of the um, the common good and maybe just just making it something that is explicitly ideological because i feel like pretty much now people who who do have an ideological bent and do want to um you know tether themselves to something like that will will inherit the future because everyone else is kind of going with the flow is essentially going off a cliff and i think that's that's you know just in my in my vision i think that that's a core thing that uh any sort of organizations like Newfounding or anything that goes in that direction will have to do because yeah, it's the mainstream is, it feels far gone. So I think there's two, there, there's sort of the, the explicit ideological and I, I don't necessarily like using the word ideological, but I would say it, it needs a substantive positive vision. It needs a substantive, it needs sort of a rich and robust comprehensive vision. And to me, Christianity offers that in a way that is, uh, there's just no alternative for that. I think there's 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 different visions of how that can be applied, but that's uh, that's the heritage of the West, and that's uh, certainly something that can provide it can provide the positive answers to the fundamental questions that as uh, as technological disruption erodes. So in many ways, I think the problem is. I don't know if it's that technology and finance fundamentally erode the things you describe so much as they're, they're levers for people with a particular vision. And if the people who are levering them, if the people who are coming up with ideas of what to build with them have a shallow understanding of human interactions, they're going to build products that reflect that. They're going to, they're going to use those levers to build things that they see as valuable. And they're going to miss many of the things that we would recognize as valuable. So there's many, uh, th- there's many things. And I'll give an example, actually, that's on the more structural side. So in many ways, I think Christianity provides a, a positive, substantive one. And I think in many ways, there's many people who are better at working out the exact bridge between what that looks like in different aspects of society, a, a society ordered according to those principles. Uh, but the way I view, uh, and this is sort of finance, but it's it's also the, the scaling of trust. So in many ways, the, the question I ask is sort of how is a how is a university like a currency? And both of those are actually trust scaling institutions. So we think of finance and we think of finances for, we, we think of sort of the currency and the finance side as a, as a very obvious form of scaling credit. But when a university prints credentials, it's doing many of the same things. That credential is going to give you the ability to gain control, leverage over resources in a very similar way to finance. And I think that that's where we could envision a system that is actually far more conducive to the types of community and personal interactions than anything that exists today. And it would actually leverage technology to make, uh, it, it would leverage technology or use technology to add leverage to interactions that are both more personal and have potential economic uh, economic utility, but right now have been largely crowded out. So I could elaborate on that uh, that vision, but if you think about it, and I, I believe you spent time in London uh, in finance, and that's that's a good example. Someone in much of Europe looking for opportunity naturally is going to go to they're going to go to the places that offer leverage. And I think right now the structure of the economy, uh, if you're someone in Middle America, you go to a distant university that gives you uh, that give you first of all you spend a lot of your time playing a game that is set according to the rules set by Harvard. You compete for the schools. You, you try to get into the schools that are going to be ranked well according to those criteria. You put a lot of effort into homework. You put a lot of effort into things, much of which has utility, but really fundamentally follows a set of rules that get you into that Harvard or, 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 or school that's ranked high according to a similar standard to Harvard. You go there. You now leave your community. You spend a lot of time there. You build a new set of friends. You build a new set of... Uh, build a, maybe they're not friends, right? Really, in many cases, they're people... I would have very little in common with, but professionally, those are valuable relationships. Uh, you then graduate from there. You don't go back to your hometown. You go to, let's say, McKinsey. McKinsey is just another layer on that credential hierarchy, which is a, a better source of leverage. And the point is, people keep playing that game for years and years. Go from McKinsey to Harvard Business School, go from Harvard Business School back to private equity. And all of those are essentially climbing a ladder that right now is highly concentrated in these sort of global cities. Imagine if, uh, but if, if you think about it, uh, if you're hiring someone, uh, Harvard Business School is a valuable credential. Traditionally, it's been seen as a valuable credential. But for many, many, many people, 
what they would accept as an even better credential effectively is the recommendation of someone whose judgment they trust. Someone in my church recommends someone highly, someone successful, someone who's just, not, not just anyone, but I know within these tight human communities whose judgment I trust. And if he recommends someone, that's an even better credential. Imagine if, imagine if there were a world where you could invest the same effort you spend trying to get into Harvard in building deeper relationships in your local community, building deeper relationships professionally around people whose recommendation could be more broadly recognized as as valuable as that Harvard MBA. Uh, suddenly, you have an alternative path, and you no longer feel the pull. It's not that people want to be at McKinsey. It's not that they. It's not that that's their dream life is to sit at McKinsey. They recognize McKinsey as that that rung of the ladder that will get them more opportunity. Imagine if you could do something. Maybe it's even lesser paying, but it it, it is with someone in your local community. You know, if you crush it, if you impress that person you could then get a recommendation that could open up a similar range of opportunity. Uh, I think in many ways, the, the latter is how much of the world worked through much of history. But increasingly, we've been crowded out by these sort of distant institutions, the sort of things that will draw you to London, the sort of things that will draw you to New York, that will draw you to Cambridge. And I don't, think that's, I don't think that's necessary. So I think the right technology, in some ways, the right financial instruments uh, can... Uh, in many ways, I'd say the former is actually the result of a progressive vision of the world. A progressive vision of the world fundamentally is suspicious to those local communities. It views them as sort of ignorant. It views them as prejudice, right? That recommendation, they're going to view as inherently tainted by all sorts of biases and racisms and all of that. Uh, whereas the judgment of these institutions like Harvard are much more in line with their ideological vision. So it's not just a natural product of sort of economic development that you're sucked away to these distant institutions. It's actually a, a conscious good to people with a progressive worldview that you're moved out of your community and moved into something that's going to make you more, give you a broader, more global perspective. Uh, so they so they build institutions that actually focus on doing that, that aim, the, the greatest good is getting people out of their community. Imagine if entrepreneurial effort, if technology, if finance was actually spent on trying to add leverage to uh, the judgment of people in local communities so that you can then redirect all of that effort that people put on this sort of college and early career rat race into, uh, into building trust in local communities, building trust among sort of highly respected members of those communities. Uh, to me, that's a much, much more human vision of society. And it's actually a vision of society that is, is it's going to be more dynamic. Uh, there's going to be a higher level of economic vitality. And it's also going to be a vision that's just much more natural and communal. Yeah, I think that's in a way an attempt to kind of maybe not turn the clock back, but to re-inject a certain ethos into the, the local community. And I guess the, the first challenge that appears to me here is just to kind of um, yeah, scale, I guess, you know, it depends obviously which local community you're referring to. I guess you can't scale these communities all over the place at the same time, I guess maybe a little bit with technology, but to, to reach um, these network effects, uh, you'd have to essentially have buy-in from people who say, okay, yeah, we're not going to follow the, the, the usual path, you know, the dream of sending our kids to, to faraway colleges, but we're going to, uh, yeah, invest our trust in this. And I guess, like I said, in a way, in a way it takes a certain ideological commitment to say, okay, we have this trust in, this network and these local institutions. Um, and yeah, we're going to, we're going to run with this. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's probably, I mean, I don't know exactly what your challenges are, but this is kind of what, what I could imagine would be a, a, a problem, at least in, in the first few iterations of, of, of this experiment. So I see it as local, but, and I use the word local as an example, but I actually think my view is it's actually twofold. My view is communal is maybe a better way of describing it. But I think you have you have local communities, but you also have aligned communities. And I actually think the more interesting ones, the ones we're really focusing on, are actually aligned communities that are not they're not necessarily geographically uh, organized. So if you think of the sort of informal community that you're a part of, you're you're obviously not in proximity to most of them, but there's a real sense in which they actually have there, there's sort of common outlooks on life. There's common questions that enable something that would be a deeper and truer community than many communities around people who share a certain outlook on the world. And so I think that what you can do is you can actually have a, a digitally organized community 
uh, there's often going to be in person, there's going to be in person conferences. I mean, I think of a lot of the people who I, uh, I've gotten to know through the, the political side of what I've been doing, where you see each other at conferences a few times a year, you interact regularly online, uh, have calls periodically, have a lot of overlap. And there's actually, there's sort of a deeper and richer level of community than many sort of casual business acquaintances in a local, in a, in a local network. And to me, that's, and it's also a much, much deeper sense than random Harvard classmates or something where there's just, I have so little in common with them. I feel very, very little meaningful sense of community. So I think that, I, I think building around alignment is the fundamental one. Ideally, you want to actually have a, an aligned community in proximity to you. Churches are often a great example of that, but uh, where there tends to be sort of a shared outlook and a smaller community. But then the, the concentric circles around which you would focus on doing business, maybe a few other sort of a few other local communities, but then it may be some digitally organized, very disparate ones as well. And uh, you think of a lot of people who have gotten opportunities through their Twitter networks. And I think that's a great example of that, where they really they really do feel like there's a there's, there's a community that exists there that is often actually missing in the random neighbors in your apartment building or whatever. So I, I, I don't think we need to be limited to local. Let's put it that way. I think that local, I think it'll be great if there's actually localities where you have clusters develop, where you have both that alignment and that, that local nature. But for, for the sort of people who are drawn to London, for the sort of people who are drawn to New York, there's always going to be, I think, more than most local communities can provide alone. Yeah, I think that's kind of what I um, found out by, you know, moving back to to my small hometown and kind of trying to juggle both types of communities because obviously I've got a, a wider network in the world and, and that's probably where I spend the bigger chunk of my time, though I'm trying to kind of flip that and, and, and move, you know, by socializing in person with, with, uh, with the people around me. Um, and it just feels like these are just two separate universes. And I, maybe this is just like a more of a, of a, you know, modern philosophical, you know, t- how do we deal with technology type of point, but um, it, it does seem like they're, they're quite siloed. And I guess if you reach a certain scale with uh, a project, then it can trickle down into, into the real world. But it does, it does feel like now it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's much easier to, to reach alignment with, with people far away than, than people close to you, which I think is, yeah, a bit of a, um, a bit of an issue, <laughs> at least at least in my in my personal life. I think it applies to. There's a certain segment of uh, maybe a somewhat restless soul who uh, that's always going to be true for. And I think there's uh, your outlook. Your outlook is uh, is global in scale in some ways. And I think that there's always going to be uh, more. But I, I'm in Dallas actually because I believe that Dallas is naturally. I came here as a city I wanted to go along on. I'm not from here, but. I think Dallas, I have this sort of thesis that Dallas is the natural capital of red America. Uh, I don't think it's achieved that yet, but I think it has the traits needed to, uh, you could almost say it's sort of cosmopolitan in an American sense, right? It has all of the American subcultures represented here. Anyone from anywhere in the country can move here and feel comfortable. Uh, geographically, it, it, climate-wise, it's missing something. But in terms of culture, anyone can move here. It's a, it's a large metropolis. So I actually see the potential to sort of build a hub here. We're actually looking this morning, I was touring buildings. We're actually looking at buying a building that can become a sort of a line, you could say a based old, a based WeWork concept, a, a place where we can actually build a shared office space for uh, really mission focused businesses. And I think there's a tremendous, we're already doing some of this. There's a tremendous demand for that level of community if you're going to go to work in an area where anyone can work at home to actually have a community where you you want to talk to the people in your office. You want to actually have something really serious in common with them. And I think there's a few cities, there's a few cities where we can achieve this, where we can actually bring the same sort of discussions that exist in these online communities into, if, if nothing else, just a single building, maybe. If we all work in the same building, uh, that could probably exist in most major cities in the US. Uh, far more than just sort of the, the three or four that people have traditionally gone to for that level of community and conversation. Uh, might be, I don't know the size of your area. I, I think there will be limits to how much that can be achieved locally, although there's also these sort of local hubs that you see developing in different areas where there are smaller towns that are gaining a cluster often around a pastor of some sort of very online pastor, for instance, and they'll become a cluster where people move and they're really conducive to raising families in a sort of small town environment where you actually 
share a lot of common outlook. So I, I think you're starting to see a sorting that is actually going to bring together some of the online and the uh, and the in person. Yeah, yeah, and I I hear this from a lot of people, especially in uh, especially in just pr- pretty much only in the U.S., which is <laughs> one of uh, one of kind of the challenges of being European and and interested in these in these ideas. Um, Europe, in a way, is a obviously it's it's very heterogeneous. It's not uniformly the same. Obviously, Eastern Europe itself has all sorts of um, regional issues and and psychoses, but um, we're in a way we're. Um, we're getting the the latest programming from uh, from the U.S. and like you know all the all the younger people are kind of downloading all the all the software updates, but at the same time you have a genuinely especially in the rural areas, um, you know, there's no better word than essentially backward uh, population as well, and you have kind of these almost centuries between generations. It's a very strange thing. And then obviously the push for the younger generations to uh, to heal the backwardness first, um, instead of you know doing anything else, is um, is is very intense. So it's the the pushback against liberalism is very weak here. It's just uh, it, it's still seen as a I mean liberalism in the sense of whatever's going on now in the, the U.S. and whatever you know people are interested in in terms of politics. I mean. You know things like Black Lives Matter and things like that are, are you know, trans rights are starting to to pop up in in our media as well, and it's it's a huge contrast between this and you know like highly orthodox Christian old women in the countryside. Like I would mm-hmm. say, you could you could sense a millennium between these generations, like completely different perspective on the world. You know, just experience of life. So um, yeah, it's it's a it's a strange thing. So we've we haven't. We didn't get like 50 years of, of uh, you know, the sexual revolution and all the type of things that you, you had. We had 50 years of communism, which is a completely different, you know, <laughs> type of trauma. Um, and the result is that, you know, people aspire to the West. And to be honest, whatever the West is cooking is what we're going to have uh, at the moment. And, you know, thinking about that, you know, people are at very strange, you know, uh, levels of... Uh, of a relationship with, with all this new stuff. I mean, a lot of people are put off by trans just because it is so jarring and very you know, sudden and, you know, it, it involves their children and it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a complete thing. And even, even someone who's, who's open-minded and speaks English and is very, you know, very much aspires to be Western uh, is a little bit shocked <laughs> by the, by the yep. newest, uh, the newest rollout from, from uh, our betters. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, Essentially, my conclusion is it's this stuff is you know the hubs that that I would be interested in. It's just not they just don't are not here yet. I mean, we're kind of in a strange limbo position before the the big wave hits, and I think that's probably going to happen. Like in the next five ten years, people are going to actually have an organized backlash against this stuff here as well. But for now, you know, I might need to <laughs> beg for a U.S. visa at one point. Um, in a way, yeah, because it, even though the most extreme manifestations of all this are happening in the U.S., the most serious uh, organized backlash against it is also happening in the U.S. So it's um, it's an interesting place to be in, I guess. Don't don't leave the U.S. anytime soon. So I think in many ways that's that's to be expected. That's very natural. With uh, I, I mean, Americans move, right? Americans by culture will get up and move. They'll start sorting. I think. I think there's a very high likelihood that we're headed towards some sort of national divorce, national dissolution. And to me, that's to me, that's maybe the natural just state of the trajectory of we're seeing a radical revolution, a radical digital revolution. When you have that level of technological revolution, you're going to have a your baseline expectation should be that there's sort of a low likelihood that the same structure will will uh emerge for the next, uh, or at least it's sort of maybe a 50-50 or something that the same structure makes sense in the next generation. Uh, and I think temperamentally, Americans are naturally suited uh, suited to sort of pushing the boundaries of both visions of what that could look like. So I uh, naturally, we're, we're at the forefront of the trans revolution and all that stuff, uh, or, or near the forefront of that. Uh, certainly, the Anglo world is. But we're also, and I think the U.S. Is, is probably the leader on the trans thing. But I also think that we naturally will come up with an alternative positive vision. So certainly Europe's more conservative, more temperamentally conservative in many ways. Uh, 
even where they're conserving liberalism, right? They're more conservative at conserving liberalism. Uh, but I, I could see these new hubs in the U.S. presenting an alternative positive vision. My hope would be that that's actually a positive vision that much of the uh, right in Europe, to the extent they look to America, can now look at something that's meaningfully different that uh, I, in, in many ways, may actually allow them to uh, get there in a cleaner way with fewer changes if they already have have elements of things that are are, are more developed there. So. Yes, I think the sort of sorting that you're happening in America, I think the the development of these communities, these ferment, really what, what New Founding is aiming to be at the center of, which is helping uh, match the people and opportunities to actually build the country they want to live in, to build build the vision of society that they want to live in, is uh, is going to, as quickly as possible, get to some pretty definite positive uh, positive alternatives for the digital age. Yeah, it's, it, it is interesting because there are a lot of kind of natural experiments in, in the direction of, of sorting happening right now. I mean, the, the case of South Africa seems to be most uh, most acute. I wonder if you if you draw any inspiration from what's going on there. Obviously, it's not an identical case, but I think the, the trend line is, is, is towards that. Um, obviously, I think what, what is very different in South Africa is the, um, the strength and in- integrity of the state itself. I think a lot of things that would not be possible in the U.S. are possible in, in South Africa just because, um, you know, just kind of essentially segregating in, entire communities from from the mainstream and just, you know, having a private police force and, you know, plopping a, a city in the middle of X region is something that it's already going on there. It's apparently an experiment that's, that's working. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I would not imagine that to be possible in the U.S. at the moment with the strength of the of the state of the central state you would need yeah, the central state. you would need strong red state leadership to do some of that i think the states do in the us the states do have primary police power so theoretically they could do almost all of that you do have uh, you, you do have the sort of ever present risk of civil rights predicated harassment of them or trans rights predicated harassment of them. So I think, and then you have this sort of tax and redistribution power that's going to punish them. But that's, that, that exists even in South Africa. Uh, in, in many ways, we face a sort of more powerful central state, although I, I suspect that state capacity will, uh, continue, will decline uh, at the central level in the U.S., which is one of the forces that will allow this, uh, this sort of trend toward greater, uh, it, it would allow the sort of break up. Uh, it, it may be a very messy process. Uh, but at the same time, I also think we have stronger uh, groups of people and, and local units that could actually organize something to the counter. So uh, they're really working from a, uh, a, a, a challenged point in South Africa where there's fairly small groups of people. It's groups of people who have, in many ways, most of them have been stripped of their guns, I believe. They've been stripped of a lot of things. Uh, they don't have units like Red State that have that level of of potential uh, legitimacy and police power, I don't think uh, it, it, it's probably a level below that. Is my my impression of the space? Uh, we do we we haven't yet achieved that level of of sort of independent fork uh, at the level of a red state, but I think it's possible. So uh, there's going to be a. I mean, to me, it is going to be private efforts that probably push the envelope. What really inspires me about uh, really the finance, the private sector finance and tech together is, uh, and, and this is, I think, the path to win. This is really the missing thing that I see on the right is the path to how we win. And we can aggregate power. The, the nature of network effects are such that I think we can aggregate power at a much, much faster rate. And they can really compound to a very, very large level very quickly with few structural impediments by leveraging new technology in domains that lack that same sort of structural impediment, really domains about building trust, building new trust-based networks, uh, really focused around the sort of local connect, local and aligned connections I talked about. Uh, but that'll be done in cooperation with the, the state level institutions that have that level of legitimacy. In many ways, they need to make room for that. But to me, that, that offers a path to aggregate power far faster and with fewer impediments than we're likely to experience if we try to do it via primarily sort of electoral political process like taking over state parties and and using that as the primary tip of the spear that's that's a uh, that's a place where we you know it's not just the central state but it's actually the just the legacy 
uh, the established institutions, the established relationships, the established regimes in those spaces that are going to be an impediment. Whereas the private sector, I think, offers the same sort of entrepreneurial opportunities that you see in in societies like that. I wonder what you uh, so how how do you think about um, gatekeeping in the context of something like new founding because because it's a it's a structured kind of vision driven enterprise. Um, is there a limit to who can join, who can participate, who can have inputs, who can, um, you know, direct or, or things like that? Because a, a lot of the issues that you have with right-wing organizations or kind of explicitly, you know, conservative right-wing organizations is that um, they tend to slowly drift into the direction of the mainstream because, you know, the, the, the larger they get, the more people join, the more people join, the, the larger the chances that you know, people will be maybe just loosely aligned with the core value, but actually, you know, they're still, they still are uh, more, mostly aligned with, uh, with the right side of history. So um, I wonder how you think about this. So fundamentally, and this is, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this. I would say this is probably the, the question. It, it's the related question. So the question of how do we win and how do we avoid the sort of mission drift that has killed almost every right-wing institution, almost every conservative institution. And I, I would say there's sort of three things. I think one is the conservative mindset itself fundamentally allows, it, it, it creates a sort of ratchet mechanism where it slows things down, but it doesn't have enough of a distinct independent vision that it tends to allow the directions to still be set by the left. So if that's, if that's your defining value, you're going to tend to see a, and I don't get to the gatekeeping, I guess, which is related, but I guess this is pointing to the bigger question of how we avoid that, that capture and drift. Uh, I think if we have an alternative positive vision, you're going to have less of that than you do if you're, if you're simply defining yourself as conservative, if you're simply about slowing things down. Uh, second of all, and, and these are related, I think operating within a status hierarchy con controlled by the enemy is the fundamental vulnerability you see frequently. So you think of Christian colleges and the so many Christian colleges, Christian college I went to, Kelvin College, which is almost totally captured by the left. Uh, very, very little distinct about it. And fundamentally, those schools operate in a status hierarchy that falls under the sort of umbrella of Harvard and the other elite schools. They brag about getting graduates into those schools. They're happy when they can hire professors with uh, so-called prestigious degrees by a standard prestige set by those schools. They care if their professors get published in journals that are controlled by those schools. And ultimately, if, uh, if you're operating in someone else's status hierarchy, no matter how distinct your vision, there's going to be a sort of gravitation to uh, find a way to, to conform it to their standards, to fit it under their standards. And that to me is, that's the biggest flaw of the right uh, by far, is if you accept their, if you accept their standards, you will conform to their views. I think uh, you, you saw this during COVID where many, many conservatives uh, were afraid to dissent too far from the sort of received opinion. Uh, whereas those who had contempt for those elite institutions who really recognized how fundamentally bankrupt they are from a credibility standpoint, were unafraid to be just totally dismissive uh, and essentially establish their own status hierarchy. We have a completely different standard. Harvard doesn't know what an education means anymore. Look at Yale, right? Jason Stanley teaches at Yale. Jason Stanley is a professor of philosophy at Yale. Jacob Yurofsky, professor. <laughs> yeah, he has no <laughs> idea what an education even means. I, I have absolute contempt for his opinion of whether uh, whether something I say makes sense. And if he's a professor at Yale, why should I care about Yale's approval about anything I do uh, if I'm establishing an alternative institution? So I, I think that's a, that is a mistake that, uh, it, it's a mistake that the movement has accepted. Uh, if you have an independent status hierarchy, you have less of a concern of a gatekeeping at that point, because the incentives to rise, you, you can let a lot of people in, but the incentives to rise will be uh, independent of the mainstream ones. The sort of people who rise will, will be those who fit the standards that we set, which is why we need a distinct positive vision. The sort of people who maybe we let them in, but they ultimately are sort of split between uh, the sort of, they're split between regime ambition and, and, and ambition here are probably just, they're going to have to make a decision, and at one point or another, they're going to they're going to make a decision that gives up the other option. Uh, so they're in, but they're not likely to be in positions of power and influence. Uh, and, and really, 
there needs to be enough control of that hierarchy that you don't let it get captured by the left. But again, that comes from a, a truly distinct right opinion. And then finally, I think there's an element to what I'm doing at New Founding. And this goes to that, the, going back to that question of sort of structure, what types of technology and finance are conducive to the world that we want? I, I, I guess at a high level, the sort of networks we're hoping to achieve, and I'll use talent as an example. So one of our core products is our, our talent network. We help people move from largely woke companies to uh, aligned companies. And I use the word aligned uh, in an interesting sense. It kind of, on the one hand, it means sort of aligned with us, aligned with our vision. And in an early stage, it's not a huge network. So it tends to mean aligned with our vision. But what I really mean by that ultimately is aligned with their values, aligned with their vision. Ultimately, woke people don't have any interest in that. They, by nature, they actually want to sort of conform to the the Borg, the uh, the the American CCP vision. Uh, but the whole idea of of hiring people who align with your values, who come from an aligned community, uh, is essentially a a a model that favors in group preferences. And I would say that actually that could apply to multiple communities. We could have multiple communities that all have a degree of in-group preferences. There could be a sort of more uh, libertarian crypto-adjacent community. There could be a Catholic community. There could be a Protestant community. And all of those might be part of the same sort of broader set of networks. But uh, there could be a sort of true liberal community, right? I mean, I think by nature, those people tend to be... They get uncomfortable with... Uh, with uh, forking away from the the mainstream because they they really want to engage but uh if we provide mechanisms that allow uh advertising job opportunities through channels that are going to reach people who share your values who tend to align with you uh that allow essentially allow you to hire people from communities that are sort of one or two concentric circles away from your own regardless of what your own is we don't need to actually gatekeep any particular uh uh, group of people in or out, but that's going to favor that. That's going to structurally favor a world where you you do business with people like you. You do business with people who share important values with you, and I would say that in itself is inherently a kind of uh, quasi localism. One could say fractal localism. Uh, it, it is the antithesis of sort of uniform globalism of that sort of vibe. Uh, uh, ideology that wants to strip every difference from people and, and turn people into interchangeable cogs. It's sort of a, an interchangeability that globalism pushes. So for me, it, you each group will tend to have their own gatekeeping function, right? Each group, in a sense, forms its own distinct status hierarchy, the sort of community that is going to have a really dynamic uh, desire to do business with like kind people likely has a sort of distinct set of values. Uh, those are the people who are motivated. They can establish standards. They can establish gatekeeping. Our mere creation of a structure that enables that commercial layer where they do more business with each other is going to favor a, a vision of the world that is the antithesis of sort of woke globalism and of interchangeability and of replacement ideology and all of that. I think there's a, a another layer to this, which uh, I, I I do see the 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 groups around Claremont do do really well is that um, bringing and maintaining a standard of of quality that's that's rare to find in other places. I mean, it's actually attractive to intelligent people who are disenfranchised, um, and there's already kind of a, a critical mass of people around these spaces. I mean, with the the, the fellows. Uh, uh, programs and um, and you know Claremont Review books and American Mind and all of these things and this is obviously not the only one but there there are more and more high quality at least as high quality as the mainstream type organizations popping up that have their own gravitational field um, the wider I would say dissident and right has a lot of kind of disenfranchised high IQ individuals in, in it um, some anonymous some less so and uh, I think. You know, there there are signs that you know this is a a formidable counter elite. Um, I don't know exactly what the the the, the macro uh, level um, critical mass is, but at least for you know for making some people nervous in the mainstream, there it it definitely has has done wonders. I mean, there's essentially a a whole podcast by by New York Times ed editors or you know 
um, tracking the movements, you know, the, the Know Your Enemy podcast yep. <laughs> of, of this space. Uh, you know, people are, are antsy about it because they, they, they feel that this is a real contender, which you did not have with like MAGA populism type stuff, which, you know, if, if you were an inter- intelligent, interested, you know, person interested in, in, in status hierarchies in any way, you know, it, it, it's, it's off-putting, it's, it's low status, you know, and the fact that obviously being out of power, they were very interested as a populist movement in like a very big tent and bringing everyone in. And then you have Lady Mag and all sorts of, you know, abominations like that. And, you know, even, even the people who are kind of pro-Trump at one point because of kind of this, the symbolism of him as this, you know, Nietzschean type of character showing up and, and taking names, um, it, it kind of fades because, you know, because of the lack of gatekeeping, because of, as you know, everyone's welcome, you know, it's a populist movement. Um, so, yeah, I think this is this is um, an important benefit to the current stage of whatever movement this is. And, and you know, people like you and Claremont New Founding, uh, I think are doing a really good job of, of actually providing the a nice, clean, interesting, intelligent face to, to this whole thing. I, I appreciate that. And I think that it is, to me, it's, it is the, and to some extent, this is the question of what, what motivates me. Right. And I, we've, we've, we've attracted since the very beginning, an exceptional array of people. That's really, that's actually helped shape the gravitational direction of our business, which is talent and venture. And in many ways, those are sort of, they're on the same spectrum, but how do we help the class of people who really want to shape the world above all, uh, which is, it's, it's an elite of sorts. It's elite or aspiring elite, but it's a group of people who want to be building a society they want. Yes, they want to take care of their family. They want to do all of that, but they want more. And how do we provide the, op- how do we match them with opportunities to build the world they want, which is fundamentally, uh, I like to call it an elite mindset in a, in a good sense. I think a lot of people are anti-elite, but really the problem is our elite, our current elite is a, is a terrible elite. I, uh, but I, that's been something that that's been exceptional. And I think to a large extent it is, there's a lot of stuff related to aesthetics. There's a lot of stuff related to talking about language, uh, but that alternative positive vision, if you provide an alternative positive vision uh, and something that actually celebrates the sort of institutions that those people uh, can operate in that draws, that draws a class of people who are, uh, who are uh, surviving in existing institutions, but really want more. Uh, and that's the, the kind of DMs I get on Twitter, the kind of LinkedIn messages I get. I mean, I, we get messages from a uh, partner at a top law firm, for instance, who is ready to leave within the next year and uh, prime of his career too. I mean, exactly the sort of opportunity that lots of uh, people would be salivating over uh, and ready to leave and jump into a movement aligned company, potentially partner on something that's critically needed. Uh, people, top people at tech companies and all of these come in and and the fact that we actually have have sort of an alternative positive vision creates a place for people like this. They can see a place where they can fit in. They could they could play a role in uh, in helping build something. Even the office space, right? It's not it's not even that we have a place for them yet in terms of you're going to start a new company, but you're running a small family office or a small hedge fund or something. We have a physical space you can come and you can actually grow your ties to this community and be a part of it and have more and more conversations of the sort you want to have. And that draws that draws people who are looking for that type of conversation in a way that is uh, it, it's exciting. That's really what uh, motivates me to keep pushing on this space. And it's it it adds meaning to you know otherwise pretty um, I don't know sterile c- career paths. I mean, a lot of you know, you're you're talking about you know partners at law firms and you know people in, involved in kind of wider global finance because that's kind of where the money is made. Uh, it doesn't really give you, you know, there's no, I don't know, sole return on, on, on your time spent there except for, for the bottom line, which I guess after a while, after a while it gets old. Um, it's, it's not as, as, um, as useful as, as it, it is at the start. So I think that's, that's definitely a, a, a very rare added bonus to, to a lot of careers. I think you know, people, people are definitely looking for that. And I'll say, I, I like that you, you touched on the word sterile and I think sterile is interesting because to me, I've, I'm actually exploring a sort of broader use of this concept, but I think sterile, it's not that work as a lawyer is inherently sterile. It's not that work in many of these roles is entirely sterile, but I think this sort of, the, the, the global mindset, the global approach to work is fundamentally sterile. I, and this going back to the, the finance question at the very beginning, I, 
I think there's this concept of live finance, right? An entrepreneurial bet on a person is fundamentally, there's something sort of alive about that. You're willing, you're taking a leap. You're often going a step beyond what could be justified purely on a spreadsheet. You justify it. There's a lot of criteria that make sense, but you're actually, you're willing to actually do something that's a little bit of a jump. Whereas ultimately, I think much of the sort of distant, heavily intermediated finance becomes fundamentally sterile and that that human judgment is stripped out of it. If you have to justify everything, if you have to justify every single decision you make on a spreadsheet, uh, you may as well be replaced by a, uh, by a bot. And what is a bot? A bot is fundamentally sterile in a way that a human is not. So I think that that human output, that output of the creative mind is, uh, it's satisfying to people to actually be able to work in a way that lets them use their judgment. You talk to stock analysts, for instance, and, and people evaluating a stock and it, at its best, you're talking to the owners, you're really getting to know the teams, you're getting to know the culture, you're making a lot of judgments. Uh, the more you turn it into sort of a, a pure systematic algorithm, uh, that trends toward, I mean, I think it ultimately trends toward indexing. And there's nothing more sterile than the way BlackRock invests. I mean, it's fundamentally, and even like ESG, when you add, when you want to add factors on top of that, you do it through sterile formulas uh, that just at the high level, at this incredibly abstracted global level, just add some criteria. I mean, that's fundamentally different than uh, caring about, let's say, let's say you do care about sort of elements of conservation and the environment. Well, there's entrepreneurial opportunities to actually look at, let's say, a, a new development that's going to be done in a way that's really going to do something that blends in with the environment well. There's sort of the, the fundamentally living creativity of the architect that's doing something interesting that fits the local landscape. That would be, that would be the human way of doing it. The sterile way of doing it is you just tweak your E formula a little bit in some sort of uh, ETF that's going to be percolating out through, uh, through uh, indices. And I mean, ultimately, I think we've seen a world of finance that trends toward passive indexing. It, there's nothing better in some ways to invest in than an apartment, com- an existing apartment complex or a, a government bond when you're trying to strip the human judgment out of it, which is what in many ways uh, our current the sort of dominant doctrines in finance do is they they want to strip out the human judgment. They they deprecate the value of that human judgment. I uh, in many ways that it becomes sort of self fulfilling. I think the way the the way the Fed deals with interest rates, the way uh, the more people believe in indexing, the more indexing is going to tend to outperform. But that that's not going to last forever, I don't think. And and that makes that entire class of jobs feel dead in a way. You're you have to be suspicious of your own judgments in a way that, that that tends toward thinking you could be replaced by a bot and you probably could be. And I think if we can, if we can recognize that there's actually value in that human judgment, there's value, there's value in, in a lawyer who is able to actually do something that's more, more human. There's value as an investor in, in making that judgment about the actual principles and owners you invest in. I think that just makes work feel... I mean, it's interesting. Marx talked about the sort of alienation of labor. Uh, and his idea of alienation, I think, was a fundamentally... It's actually antithetical to... A, so George Gilder had an interesting contrast. George Gilder talks about how sort of capitalism is fundamentally... Or the market system is fundamentally selfless, right? You get paid for... I get paid for thinking about what you're going to want and putting myself, putting my sort of creative energies into producing something that you're going to want. And that's the essence of sort of a selfless, very Christian-inspired view of the world. Whereas Marx views that sort of creation of something that goes to someone else as fundamentally alienating. So it's a it's a fundamentally different view. To me, the alienation that we see today, it, it's not about the product of my work going to someone else. That's actually good. That's inherently selfless. That's actually that that's satisfying. The alienation comes from stripping the human out of it and reducing it to a rote process. I uh, reducing it to a process where my judgment rather than being valued and trusted and levered is actually, uh, is, is sort of bureaucratically subordinated. And if we can imagine an economy that is elevating the human, uh, it's going to be much more satisfying to people. It's also going to actually elevate the things that are not likely to re- be replaced by a, not likely to be replaced by bots. So I actually think our, our model is actually, far more robust. Uh, it, it'll help people develop skills that are far more robust and far more sort of distinctly human in an era where the uh, 
the bureaucratic skills are highly vulnerable. Yeah, there's um, there's there's something about the, the the way that the scale of of global finance leads to the kind of fragility of the system, and you know, kind of these constant boom and bust cycles that we've kind of gotten accustomed to at this point, where it's almost crying out for an, an alternative, and the alternative sounds more like you know local credit unions. I mean, just like bringing injecting skin in the game at the at the bottom of the hierarchy because the whole superstructure is just so opaque that even the people in the highest echelons don't exactly know what's going on and are dependent on, you know, different types of information from different inputs. Um, and yeah, things just happen to to, to go uh, to go bust uh, occasionally. And then obviously there's all sorts of kind of mythological layers to how things can go on. I mean, you had this mythological layer, uh, uh, layer with, with um, real estate prices at one point and that, that went, uh, that went bust. Um, and now you have essentially a uh, modern monetary theory, which is kind of uh, the, the nicest new myth about, about the idea of, you know, being able to print money indefinitely because you're the one printing money, <laughs> which is, it was a very interesting uh, way of looking at things. But um, yeah, I mean, looking at uh, at how um, inflation's just been been booming around the world. I mean, something's a bit rotten at the core of this theory as well. So um, yeah, it, it feels like uh, it's the time to to maybe reinvent the wheel with with just you know banking in the in the most intimate way with people that you know and trust and in a in a more uh, kind of limited size. And that's that is the key, I think, to our our sort of movement victory. And the way I, I think you're exactly right. And in some ways, we're going to see, I expect a sort of credit collapse of trust collapse of institutions. So just like you can have a credit crisis, where you have this rapid delevering, you have bank runs, you, you can imagine a scenario and you you're in Eastern Europe. So I think you saw this actually, at the fall of uh, the fall of communism, where there was effectively something very analogous to a, uh, to a financial rapid financial delevering where people just lose trust in a bunch of institutions. And suddenly those institutions can just collapse almost overnight. Uh, and that can apply to a broader range than just the financial institutions. But uh, any trust-based institution, I think, can experience something somewhat similar. Uh, and assuming you have that, then the question becomes, what is the alternative? And I think we build, by building these local connections, local and aligned, and I'll keep using the word local and aligned because I think it's a distinct from the purely local, but by building independent trust communities. And I'll give an example of actually in history of an analog. So in this, I believe it was the 17th century, the Quakers in England were sort of famously high trust community in a lower trust society. And they had very strong internal norms. Barclays came out of that era. Barclays was founded by a Quaker. And they became a very desirable intermediary for a much, much broader range of people. So if we build these high trust networks, first of all, trust-based relationships even more than Bitcoin. This is kind of my critique of, of people who put too much hope in crypto. Uh, an asset is much easier to regulate. It's much easier to tax. It's much easier to suppress financially. Whereas a trust-based network is almost impossible. It, it's almost impossible for the, the tax man to claim a piece of that. If, if I trust you in a way that I know that I can take a risk doing business with you in the future, and I've invested in building that credit in a sense, it remains entirely intangible in a way that makes it almost entirely for regulators to get involved in that makes it almost impossible for uh, for uh, that to be taxed in any way. And yet that's something that is very real value. And you look at, I think, a lot of sort of minority dissident communities, uh, and they, they have a lot of that social capital that they build up. And if we invest in building that, first of all, it's it's robust to a time of turmoil in a way that few other things are. Uh, that time, I mean, imagine that time that you could have spent studying for the test to get into Harvard, building a network that can be stripped from you at a moment's notice, effectively, if you say the wrong, uh, say the wrong word. Uh, if you spend that same effort building relationships with people in a community that is deeply aligned with you, there's basically nothing that anyone can do to take away that trust. Those same people, that, that same trust-based relationship could be there if you're arrested and your assets are frozen. Uh, that means there's people who will that now be there for you. So that's it, it, it's an incredibly robust thing. Uh, you're building on the sort of remaining foundation, a society where our institutions are rotten. That person to person, that that real uh, baseline foundation of trust 
is the surest foundation on which to build trust. And then what do you have? You have a network that is standing there when there's a broader credit collapse. I think when you have a broader delevering, a uh, great example is after 2008, people don't want to remain at a lower level of, of leverage. That's, that's like a drop in society's well-being. They want to, as quickly as possible, re-cohere around sort of remaining credible pillars. And you look at like a Berkshire Hathaway in 2008, they were able to pick up a lot more during that period because they maintained sort of a high degree of credibility and people re-cohere around them. And I think you could see something similar where we have networks built on a sure foundation, built on a sure understanding of humanity they're robust to times of turmoil. They're, they're, they're robust to persecution, even as this re regime remains capable of harassing us. Uh, but when you see that collapse, and again, Haywood talks regularly about anticipating this sort of collapse. When you see that collapse, you'll see the broad middle immediately look for trust-based intermediaries who can sort of restore a sense of structure and order that was missing. And if we're standing there, we now control the institutions that are the dominant institutions in society. And we, we use that to shape the society. They, we're, not just, we're not just replicating what was lost. We now have institutions that have a very different set of norms that people have to conform to. So I see that, as, I see that analog to a financial delevering as the actual path to what gives us the, the ultimate edge to actually uh, uh, take control rather than, just, uh, rather than just survive in parallel. Yeah, I mean, that's that's obviously what's needed. I mean, if anyone's um, predictions, uh, I, don't, I don't think anyone's expecting uh, the, the, the current pathway to, to, you know, exist maybe somewhere between 20 and, and, and 100 years is the, the usual uh, estimation. So I think, yeah, it's, it's definitely high time to, to start building on the alternatives. And I'm, I'm glad uh, you guys are doing it. Um, before I let you go, I want to ask you the last question. Everyone gets this question. It's the question of the show. Um, do you have a recommendation of a uh, subversive thinker in the spirit of the show that uh, you think might be underrated? Sure. So someone very influential, and I mentioned, uh, I mentioned uh, some of what I'm doing touches on the Protestant world and the Christian world, and particularly there, a vastly and there's serious serious problems with the American evangelical world. I think there's a there's sort of pervasive ideology among the elites that no matter what their doctrine and they can have sharply conflicting doctrines, all find their way to a version of their doctrine that points to inaction, political inaction fundamentally. And no surprise, that's uh, it's the comfortable position for people who want to be uh, at peace with the regime. A, a very large share of the people you talk to who are dissidents have been influenced by Doug Wilson. And uh, Doug is a pastor uh, in Moscow, Idaho, and he's actually built a local community. So he's actually drawn thousands of people there, building, he's built a college, he's built, he, he was one of the originators of the classical Christian school movement, one of the founders of one of the early schools there and one of the major associations. And he's a prolific writer on his blog. Uh, and what's interesting is, uh, aside from his theology, he, he has a way of seeing the world uh, and, and communicating it that has has influenced a very large number of people, uh, often coming from that evangelical world who are dissatisfied with what their elites are saying and recognize something seriously wrong. And he's actually built he's built this community that really does have a fundamentally different outlook on life. Uh, he's seen things ahead of time. Uh, he's uh, he's not as active. He's, he's sort of very well known, although very in many ways marginalized in the evangelical world. Uh, but he hasn't, I, I, I think outside of the evangelical world, he hasn't been recognized as much in the sort of dissident, uh, dissident world. And yet he's, he's built this thing that in many ways would be a model, uh, a model of own space, uh, a microcosm also it's in a college town and a microcosm of the battles between uh, our view of the world and the left's view of the world that he, he he fights. So I think he would be a fascinating person to talk to. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I, I actually have heard the name Doug Wilson before, but not in any other context. And the fact there was a famous debate with Christopher Hitchens. This is from yes. my, my atheist times. I think it was even like a, a documentary style thing where they, I think, went on a, a tour of something and they had a, a series of debates. But uh, yeah, back back in the day, I, uh, you know, my my... Uh, little exposure that I had to to Doug Wilson, I was 
completely opposed to his world view. So I thought, you know, Hitchens was obviously the, the winner in that. Obviously, I should probably revisit that uh, uh, those debates and, and maybe I, I'll have a change of heart now, maybe 10 years later. Um, There's a reason yeah. that Hitchens respected him. And I think Hitchens, yeah. Hitchens was willing to debate him. Hitchens had very little respect for Christians. But he respected Doug as he said, Doug, something along the lines of Doug was the only person, the only pastor he knew of who actually believed everything in the Bible and took it seriously in how he applied, applied to the world. So he respected him. He respected him a lot in his decision to debate him. And I think you actually see that today in this application of a, a truly different vision of the world. I, I, again, whether or not you agree with all of the conclusions, here's someone who takes something, a, a very different hierarchy seriously and applies it. Yeah, that's in, in itself is a is a useful and interesting and uh, worthy example to 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 study. So thank you. That's a, that's a really good recommendation. Um, and I also want to thank you for coming on. I uh, I want to point people to New Founding. Um, any other projects that people should be looking at? So New Founding has really two sides of it. There's the the talent network. You can go to our website, newfounding dot com. Uh, follow me on Twitter. I talk a lot about it as well uh, under my name, but. We have a talent network. Uh, so uh, if you are looking for a job with a company that aligns with your values, come here. If you're an employer, there's a unique and exceptional opportunity actually to pick up a bunch of people who in many cases are the best. They're, they're the, be the best people are the ones who are most frustrated by the status quo. Uh, they're the most frustrated by living in a DEI type of uh, environment. And uh, you can. we have a network of people who would not be looking for a job but for this opportunity to move. So talent... Uh, talent is something for employees and employers. Uh, and then on the venture side, uh, we actually have a lot of projects that are all sort of coming together. Uh, there's a, there's sort of a, a quasi accelerator model where we work with young companies, uh, partner with them to help uh, guide them, help match them to connections in this network, uh, work with them in a number of ways. And we've started to sign up a number of those. Uh, we have a deal room where you can submit a project uh, you can submit a deal if you're an entrepreneur looking for funding. If you're, we have people who have submitted funds that they're they're starting to raise, uh, where there's an where there's a real theme of alignment with this vision. Or if you're an investor and you're looking to see deal flow, at this uh, right now the deal room is free, so you can submit for free. You can uh, you, you can look at deal flow for free. So it's a really great opportunity to see uh, to see what's in the mix, what's happening in this world, and it remains uh, remains pretty broad in terms of the scope of projects. Uh, and then finally, American Reformer uh, is is my is a, a nonprofit. Uh, some overlap, certainly working out what that positive vision can look like. Uh, there's a journal you can think of it kind of as the Protestant first things, uh, trying to draw on a, a very very rich tradition, the tradition that helped shape America, uh, but has largely been lost at the intellectual level. So doing a lot of the same thing you just, you talked about with Claremont. Uh, in the evangelical church, which is really an anti-intellectual space. And so we have this journal that's gained a lot of traction. It actually had a, uh, probably our number one uh, in volume article ever last, yesterday talking about a, uh, a battle in the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, but there's a whole range of a uh, lot of post-liberal philosophy, a uh, lot of exploration of concepts around Christian nationalism, debate around those topics, uh, and then uh, actual work on actually reclaiming and recapturing institutions. So uh, American Reformer is a component of that. Uh, new founding, as I said, has talent and it has venture. And uh, ultimately, I would say if you, if you want to build, if you want to be building through your day-to-day -day work, uh, a society that uh, reflects your values, a society that you want to live in, in the private sector, uh, especially in the private sector, we would love to. Uh, we would love to find a way to work together. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on, Nate. This was this was really good. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. <laughs>